Good morning, everyone. Listen to me, child of God. You must understand that when you believed in the Son, in grace you forever stand. Jesus, death has satisfied, and through faith in Him, you got peace with God. 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 Oh, reconciled through the death of Christ, you're the object of God's love. So rest upon the Savior's work and eat the bread that's from above. Hold on to His promises, be assured and don't you doubt. You got peace with God You got peace with God You got peace with God Oh, peace with God You don't have to worry anymore God and you are no longer In God's family, in grace, God's given freely. Rejoice in all that He has given you. Oh, listen to me, child of God, you must understand. That when you believed in the Son, in grace you forever stand. Jesus, death that satisfied, and through faith in Him, you got peace with God. You got peace with God. You got peace with God. Get yeah, peace with God. Good morning again. Could you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1? Let me hang up this guitar. I'll be right back with you. Good morning again, and if you haven't turned there already, go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, continuing our study of uh, the book of Ephesians, just lining myself up with the camera, make sure I'm not over here somewhere, <laughs> which is probably a good thing for you people, you don't have to look at my face, but then you could always just go audio, but uh, right, so uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, we're going to look at today, as you can see on the board, we're going to study Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17 which, as we'll note, teaches us that Jesus Christ came and preached peace to the Jewish and Gentile Christian communities. And this will constitute our 119th hour in Ephesians. And uh, so this, uh, uh, unlike a lot of the verses that we've studied in this book, uh, this is only will be a one-hour study. And again, is usually if it's multiple hours for a study of a particular verse, one verse, it's only because of the content in the verses. So a lot of explaining to do, a lot of things I want to bring out. So uh, I like to take my time. And uh, of course, uh, there are other ministries, they go a little quicker. In fact, the guy who got me into the Bible really got excited about the Bible. J. Vernon McGee did a thing called Through the Bible in Five Years. So one day I might I might do that. But uh, I really, God's been well, I might put it on my heart to go the way I'm going. So I think I'm going to maintain that course. Uh, 
probably a smart idea. That's what he wants me to do. Because there's a lot of people who do that. It's like, you know, who, how many people do it really in depth studies of the Bible? Not many, not anymore. Anyways, uh, so uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17, as I said, we're going to look at that today. And uh, so uh, remember next uh, next Saturday, which is the first Sunday of the Saturday of the month, we observe the Lord's Supper. So next Saturday, mark that in your calendar. For those who are following the ministry, we'll be doing uh, observing the Lord's table, and uh, at this uh, at that uh, at that time. Uh, also, for those who might be new on Saturdays, I like to do kind of introduce who we are because we've got a lot of new people always popping in to its, on the websites or the podcast or YouTube, whatever. So this is for them. Most of you, those of you who are familiar with the ministry, don't need to hear this, but but some of it you might might not know. So uh, we're expository ministry. Uh, we uh, teach Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays mornings at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. I'm located in Huntsville, Alabama. I moved here uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, in July of two, uh, July 2nd, 2022, and uh, from Massachusetts and. Uh, um, I'm also the pastor of Doctrinal Bible Church here in Huntsville, Alabama. That's located at 1215 Russell uh, Street Northeast here in Huntsville. It's about a half mile down the road from me. And um, my location here is, uh, my address here is, uh, uh, if, you, if, if, you, if you want to send me a check or something, some people do that. It's 603 O'Shaughnessy Avenue Northeast. 603 O'Shaughnessy Avenue Northeast, Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. And you can make that check out to Winstrom Bible Ministries. It's tax deductible. Or you can go to the, the website uh, at winstrom.org and uh, go to the donate tab. Some people, a lot of people give uh, through PayPal. And uh, that's pretty convenient for people. So uh, also at Soy Doctrinal Bible Church, I teach on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. And then uh, on Sundays, I have two sessions, two hour-long sessions with a break in between. We start at 9.30. We're usually out of there by uh, before 12.00. And then we have the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of each month there. We have our corporate prayer meeting there on the last Wednesday of each month at 6 o'clock. And uh, so uh, uh, we're um, as an expository type ministry, what I mean by that is that we go through the different books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, book by book. We alternate between Old Testament and New Testament. And here at Winston Bible Ministries, we do the various doctrines of the Christian faith in between books. Whereas at uh, Doctrinal Bible Church, I do the, the dark, different doctrines of the Christian faith on Wednesday evenings. So on Wednesday evenings over there at Doctrinal Bible Church, we're doing the Day of the Lord series, a series I did when I, way back when I was at Prairie View. And, uh, and uh, so on uh, Sundays over at DBC, we're doing um, the, doctor, uh, the book of Habakkuk, which we did in 2021 here at Winston Bible Ministries. And uh, we're in the third chapter, third and final chapter there. And here we're doing Ephesians. And, uh, and, uh, so on, uh, on our, on the, on these classes. So I used to do, I used to have two different studies, two different books I'd be doing, but I stopped that when I was in Massachusetts. I, I said, what am I doing? It's like, <laughs> I'd be like in two different, well, the reason why I got into two studies for years is because, um, when I was in Iowa, there was a Sunday crowd and then it was the weekday crowd. So on the week, I had the study for the weekday people and a study for the Sunday people so that the Sunday people wouldn't miss out on something. So that's why I did it for years. So once I got to Western Bible Ministries when I was uh, in Massachusetts, um, I decided to go make it a lot easier on myself, <laughs> especially when you get as old as I am. And what else? I think, uh, oh, if you're, um, we have several different uh, several different websites. The main one is Winston.org where we have all of our material. Uh, we have over written, in PDF format, we have over 17 written artic- 1,700 written articles on our website. Over 700 are on our Academy EDU website. And also, we have a Faith Life's uh, Logos Sermons website. If you Google me, my name, Winston Bounds, you'll see all these websites. Uh, we have podcasts at Amazon Music, iTunes, Spotify, Music, and uh, you just search under Winston Bible Ministries. And uh, on the website, the Winston.org site, we have, you know, the, the different doctrines of the Christian faith are broken out, uh, categorized into de- various uh, areas of theology, like uh, eschatology, Christology, paterology. Israelology, uh, soteriology, all that stuff, pneumatology. And then we, you know, we have uh, the exposition, all these different books that we've done over the years, exegesis, exposition, in exhaustive detail. We've got Greek word studies and different studies of prep school material, a lot of te- prep school material. And so we don't charge for our teaching, <clears throat> but uh, that, um, that uh, we're totally at, at the mercy of uh, God's grace and pe- God working through his people. You know, Galatians 6, 6 says that those who are taught the word of God are sharing the things with those who teach them. 
So if you're benefiting from the ministry, you're actually obligated to help us out any way possible as the Spirit leads you. And uh, and so therefore, um, so you know, and I appreciate the people who support this ministry, the few that do, really, it's not a lot. And uh, so, um, and if you're ever down in Huntsville area, come on down, uh, or, or come on up wherever you are located in the country and the world. And uh, so... Um, it's a, we, we have, it's beautiful down here. I love Huntsville and it's, uh, it's a really been a great blessing to, to move here. I really, I've really enjoyed my time here. I love the congregation I got over here at DBC, a lot of positive volition. People are hungry for the word of God and that's just right up my alley. So, um, and also if you like, uh, the music, I, that song I wrote, we, I write my own Christian music and, uh, there's, I have like around, I have several different collections of songs. I think it's six, uh, seven or eight up on the website. And uh, each collection of song has 14 songs in it that I've written. And the last one I wrote was back in 2018 called Rejoice. That's on the website. It's also, we have a YouTube page. We've been on there since 2011. We use YouTube streaming uh, live broadcast. We use that all the time. I love that. I have that since Massachusetts. And uh, also I have playlists on the different books we've studied and the doctrines and also the music. So you can watch me play it live, uh, the music. And uh, so right now I'm in the process trying to get my stuff professionally recorded. I got two songs knocked off, but... Uh, so that's all depending on what kind of money I have to be able to do that. It's like two two hundred fifty dollars a song that the guy's charging me. He's a great producer. And he's worth a lot more than that. I mean, a lot more. And great guy. And, um, and also, um, so uh, you know, if you like the music, you, there it's it's on our website and YouTube also. So I think that's about it for uh, the announcements for those who are unfamiliar with our ministry. And let's take the moment of silent prayers. We this is our custom here at Western Bible Ministries before we begin a study of the Word of God, I want to ensure the fact that we're all in fellowship with God, and uh, so therefore that requires us to examine ourselves, that's why we take a moment of silent prayer, examine ourselves to determine if there's any known sin that we need to uh, confess, because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we don't want to be out of fellowship with the Word of God's being taught. And so uh, we, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins to the Father, he, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. And we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting you, do what 1 Peter 5, seven says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to study your almighty word. We thank you, Father, for uh, uh, the freedoms that we have in this country, and we lift up our military and political leaders that uh, are leading this country. I pray that you give them the wisdom and the moral courage to lead this country, and also raise up people around them that have godly viewpoint, that are um, influenced by what your, your spirit says in the scriptures, and will give them godly advice and uh, counsel. And I thank you for them, and I just pray you would impress upon your people, the church, to intercede in prayer for our leaders, as your word teaches us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1-7, through 7, and know that we might have a, a quiet or tranquil life, and also that uh, because you desire all people to be saved. I also uh, open, uh, open uh, lift up this country and, uh, in relation to the upcoming election, and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of concern about this, and rightly so because of previous ones. So we just pray, Father, for your will be done and you'd have your hand upon things. And uh, and I just pray that uh, whoever gets in will uphold the Constitution and uh, will go by the law of the land as uh, is the way we should. Um, I also pray, Father, for um, Winston Bible Ministries. I thank you for the people that you've raised up over the years and up to the present moment that have been uh, supporting this ministry with their prayers and financial support and serving in some capacity in this ministry throughout the years. I thank you for your faithfulness to me in this ministry, and I just pray you would use it mightily. 
I just pray, Father, today that the Spirit would use me mightily to be His instrument and help me to be sensitive to His guidance and direction. Help me to communicate your full counsel today to your people. With regards to this passage in Ephesians 2, 17 that we'll be studying today, Father, help me to do so with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power. I also pray that you would work mightily and powerfully through your children in the audience that are in union with your Son, Jesus Christ. And I just pray that the Spirit would help them to learn, to concentrate, and to understand and make uh, careful application of what they're being taught uh, so that they might receive the necessary spiritual nourishment and continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our great God and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. I also pray for the recordings, the video and the audio. I pray there no problems with the streaming video by YouTube. Thank you for the service that they provide. And I just pray, Father, that uh, there be no problems with the upload of these uh, things from, to our various websites, podcasts, the immediate platforms that you've given to us. I pray you protect them and use them mightily as you've been doing. And I pray you continue to do so. So, Father, we pray for the service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You should be at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to read for the Net Bible that chapter and then uh, read my chapter, uh, my translation of that chapter before we look at verse 17, which is our verse today, which teaches us that Jesus Christ came and preached peace to the Jewish and Gentile Christian communities. And uh, as we've been bringing out, this is a very exciting passage, and uh, it's there's so many applications that we can get out of this. The significance of this passage to us in the 21st century in the church is amazing. And I've been trying to bring that out. But uh, if, as you recall... Um, you know, the Jewish people received the uh, the covenants. You know, they were the ones, you know, Paul talks about this in Romans 9, 4 and 5, where he talks about the fact that uh, the Jewish people uh, received, they're the, their progenitors were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers. Uh, also, they received the tabernacle worship, the scriptures. Romans 3 talks about that. They received the, the Old Testament scriptures are Jewish. It's a Jewish book. The Bible's a Jewish book. And so, uh, God used Jewish men to write the, the Bible, and also the Savior uh, would the, you know, the Savior Jesus Christ would be a Jew. Salvation is of the Jews. Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well in, in John four, and so the, you know one of the prom, one of the covenants that they received. They, remember the, four, the the Israel had uh, the Mosaic covenant, which was a conditional covenant, and uh, basically the ba- blessings of the Mosaic covenant would flow to the Jewish people if they were obedient to God, because. Uh, most of the time they were not, only small remnant was believing and had faith. And so, uh, therefore, that covenant was not a way to get salvation or to get right with God. And uh, so that's why he has sent his son to become a, a human being, to suffer the wrath of God in our place. Stuff, in other words, to suffer the consequences of not keeping the law. And also to fulfill the law perfectly, which God required, if we were going to have a relationship and a fellowship with them based upon obedience to the law. So we couldn't, no one could do that in the Jewish community. Of course, no one would be able to do that in the Gentile community. And so uh, we see that the un, the new covenant, the, I mean, the other covenants were unconditional, Abrahamic, uh, Abrahamic, Palestinian, Davidic, and new covenants. The Palestinians basically the land grant. And I probably, probably Palestinian covenant is probably not a good way to describe it, but it's a part of the Abrahamic covenant. And so you have the new covenant, which had the blessings of the uh, stipulations for the forgiveness of sins in the spirit. Now, uh, so the Jews had that. And so the when people like Peter, James, and John, you know, Jesus' disciples and the apostles like Paul, believed in Jesus, they became a part of the believing remnant in, in Israel. And in every dispensation, in, in every generation of every dispensation in history, up to the present moment, God always has a certain remnant of Jewish believers. And so we see that, so they became the beneficiaries of the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Spirit. Because on the day of Pentecost, in June of 33 AD, according to Acts chapter 2, the Jewish uh, Jewish remnant of the church, and the church was primarily, it was Jewish when it first started, they, they received the blessings of the new covenant and the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Spirit. And one of the things that the Spirit did was, with the baptism of the Spirit, is he identified uh, the Jewish believers, like Peter, James, and John, and Paul, the apostles, and his, Jesus' disciples, he identified, the Spirit identified these believers at the moment of justification, conversion. They identified them with Jesus Christ in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father and placed them in union with him because they're on his headship now. Not the last Adam, but now the, uh, not the first Adam, but the last Adam. Jesus Christ is the last Adam, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. So, uh, the Jewish believers at the beginning of the church age, when it began in, in June of 33 of the day of Pentecost, according to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, that started the church age. 
And so the church would start off being Jewish. And then in Acts chapter 10, uh, with, the, the, with the help of a, a vision for Peter, he went in and evangelized Cornelius and his family who were Gentiles, the Roman centurion. Acts chapter 10 records that. The Spirit, they also received the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Spirit, just like the Jewish believers. And so that, uh, now that means that they too, like the Jewish believers, on the day of Pentecost in June of 33 AD, Acts chapter 2, these Gentile believers and Cornelius' family, they also received the forgiveness of sins and, through faith in Jesus, and they too received the Spirit, and they too received the baptism of the Spirit at their justification, which identified them again like the Jewish believers, with Jesus in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of the right hand of the Father. And that's very important that you know that, because if you read Paul's writings, he stresses this a lot. Romans, uh, the first, uh, first chapter 6, talks 7 and 8. Uh, you also see uh, Colossians 2 and 3, Ephesians 2, as we're saying. You know, when Paul says you're crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, that means God looks at you now and me, as crucified, when Jesus was crucified, he th considers us to be crucified. When he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he was raised, we were raised. When he was seated, we were seated at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because he's we're now under his headship. That's why we're said to be members of his body. He's the head, we're the members of the body. He's the vine, we're the branches. He's the cornerstone, the building, and, the, and we're the, the he's the chief cornerstone, we're the stones of the building, as we'll see in the rest of the chapter of Ephesians 2. And that's very important. So we're, in, we're married to Jesus. We're, so Ephesians 5 talks about that, both Jew and Gentile believers. Now what's fascinating is that in the Old Testament, you know, it was predicted that the Gentiles would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord. And Paul mentions this in Romans 15. What was not known to the Old Testament saints, and we'll see this when we get to chapter 3 of Ephesians, what was not known to Old Testament prophets, which was a mystery, Paul calls it, uh, musterion, and that's basically not known to Old Testament saints, a doctrine that was not known to them. And that was, as we'll see in Ephesians 3, 6, is that Jewish and uh, Gentile believers are co-heirs, co-fellow member, uh, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the Messianic promise with Jewish believers. That was not known to Old Testament saints. But now, this is significant because now it means that Gentile believers are not second-rate citizens in God's kingdom. Very fascinating. So remember, Paul talks about this in Romans 11. And remember he said about the wild olive branch and the olive tr branch tree. The olive tree of that passage is Israel, regenerate Israel. The br branches on the olive tree are Jewish believers. The ones that have been, ta fall, uh, been taken off the, the olive tree are unbelievers in the Jewish community. And we were just Gentiles, were a wild olive branch. They were engrafted in contrary to nature. It wasn't done. Okay. Why did Paul do that when it's not what they did in the real in real in the real world? Because he wanted to emphasize the supernatural nature of us Gentiles being united to Jewish believers, and that took place. And so we received the blessings of the new covenant, the Spirit, and the forgiveness of sins because we were united not only with Christ, who is the the, the head of the, the King of the Jews, right, and also the head of the church, but he also simultaneously united us with Jewish believers. So that's why. Though the covenants weren't given to, to, to the church, they were given to Israel. But Gentiles didn't receive the law, but they would get, they benefit from the law through faith in Jesus Christ. Benefit, excuse me, in the, in the new covenant through faith in Jesus Christ, the gift of the Spirit, forgiveness of sins. So this is very. So you and I now are part of the new humanity that Paul calls it, the new man, and. So that means, this, that's significant in the in relation to the angelic conflict and the history of, and the, what's coming down the pike for this world, what's in the future, this wonderful, amazing future that God has for us after the tribulation, right? Is that, remember Adam and Eve, they were said, God said, rule over the world. He, they created, he created them in his image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and they were to rule over the works of his hands. Now, Hebrews 2, Paul mentions that we don't see all things subjected to mankind because of the fall. And Satan usurped the authority of Adam and Eve in the fall. We know that because he's said, he said to be the God of this world at this time, temporarily. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. 1 John 5, 19, the whole world is under his power and he deceives the entire world. So that is its temporary condition until the second advent of Christ, when Christ comes back to start the kingdom on earth. So right now, well, starting with Jesus Christ, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father, 
his that those events in Jesus Christ's life and him sitting down at the right hand of the Father is the first step in restoring humanity to rule over the over creation over over the earth and dispossess Satan and the fallen angels. Now, starting in the day of Pentecost in June of 33 A.D., according to Acts chapter two, and then with Cornelius' family in Acts chapter ten. Jewish and Gentile believers, every time some Jew or Gentile gets saved by believing in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are placed in union with Christ and identified with them with Christ. That's those, we're in this process of getting the Jesus' bride ready. Okay, When the rapture happens, when that will take place after the last person in the church has been born and saved and, uh, and, and whatnot. And so now when we come back with Christ at his second advent, to end the 70th week of Daniel, the times of the Gentiles, and uh, to defeat Antichrist and the false prophet and the tribulation armies, and then imprison, he'll imprison Satan and the fallen angels at that time. In fact, Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, he says, don't you know you're going to judge angels? So you and I, our th- reason why we're a threat to Satan is, as it says, our greatest enemy is an invisible enemy, Satan, and his kingdom. And that's Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. So that's why we're his arch enemy, because for a number of reasons. One, we're mucking up the works for him right now. Second of all, uh, we're reminded that he's going to be removed as the temp- as the god of this world, the ruler of this world, with Christ and his bride, the church. Is that something? So you and I are pretty hot stuff, not because of anything we've done, but because of what God has done for us through faith in Jesus Christ, the work of the Son, and the work of the Spirit. So we need to live our lives accordingly as spiritual aristocracy and spiritual rulers that we are. Because that's who we are positionally. That's what we're going to be in a resurrection body with rewards. And God wants us to live our lives in a fashion that corresponds to the great position that we've been given. And that, you know, we've been given great privilege and with privilege comes responsibility. So we need to live that in a way that's uh, pleasing to Him and represents Him as royal ambassadors in a Christ-rejecting world. Because we want to lead people to the Savior. So our, our behavior is very important with relation to that. And so Paul, in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, is discussing this new humanity. And he talks about how it all came to pass. And uh, it's just a fascinating section of the book. And it, it, just show, it just shows you, you know, where God, where the world is trying to get unity and peace uh, through social programs or politics or some kind of political activism. Uh, the Father did it with His Son's work at the cross in the baptism of the Spirit. We have the race problems that we have in the world can be resolved through the baptism of the Spirit, the gospel. The gospel changes everything. The gospel is the solution to the world's problems because the world's problems are supernatural. And uh, you could talk about political, economic, social problems, problems with race, the genders, uh, you know, male and female, parents and children, the problems we have, the turmoil that we have in our country, it all stems from the fact that, as Paul said in the first three verses of chapter two, where the human race is enslaved to sin and Satan in this cosmic system. And the only deliverance from that enslavement is the gospel, by trusting in the gospel and putting it into practice. And so uh, we would have no problems with race in the church ever. We should never have it because we're on equal footing with each other. We're all equal before the cross. We're all placed in union with Christ. We're all identified with Christ and we're members of his body. So, uh, and we have the same spiritual uh, heritage and blessings that we've been given with each other. So we should be no arrogance or pride or any kind of racial prejudice towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's all because of the gospel. Uh, And so, uh, you know, in a positional sense, we're united and there's, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, Male or female, we're all one in Christ, Galatians 3, 26 through 28. And also in a perfective sense, in a resurrection body, that'll be the case forever. And now we want to experience that unity uh, by obeying the command to love one another, because that's the purpose of Ephesians, by the way. Uh, when we get to the application section of the letter, which is the final four, three verses of, chap- of the book, the first three verses are the indicatives of the Christian faith, the, the doctrine. Then the application of that teaching of the first three chapters is found in the last three chapters. And so the purpose is to keep this unity experience, experientially between the Jewish and Gentile Christian communities. We do that by obeying the Lord's command, John 13, 34 and 15, 12, to love one another as I have loved you and all that involves. 
So that's a little uh, brief uh, introduction review of what we've been covering and what we'll continue to look at and uh, in, in the future with regards to this uh, study of Ephesians chapter 2. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. I'm reading from the Net Bible. And although you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly lived, according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now energizing the sons of disobedience, among whom all of us also formerly lived out our lives and the cravings of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you were saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? To demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you were saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works, that God prepared beforehand, so we may do them. Therefore, remember formerly, you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision that is performed on the body by human hands, that you were at that time without the Messiah, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, the one who made both groups into one and who destroyed the middle wall of petition, the hostility, when he nullified in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees. He did this to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace, and to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by which the hostility has been killed. And he came and he preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who were near, so that through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you're no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, because you've been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also, are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And uh, so let me uh, read from my my translation. Now, a couple of things about my translation, more interpretive, as I said before, all translations interpretive. Mine a little bit more, more wordier because I'm your interpreter. Uh, if I was on a translation committee, I would not translate the way I do uh, in every instance. Now, one of the things I like to bring out in my translation and before I read it is that you, you remember, as you read Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 with me, a whole chapter, actually. You see that phrase, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in Him? Well, that those prepositional phrases contain what we call the figure of metonymy. That means that Christ, or Jesus Christ, is put for faith in Him at justification and union and identification with Him through the baptism of the Spirit. In other words, what Paul's doing, and a lot of Bible scholars and expositors have noticed this, he's using shorthand by doing this. So when he used the phrase in Christ, in Christ Jesus, or in him, he's he's alluding to that. Justification by faith and union identification with Christ through the baptism of the Spirit, which also took place at your justification. Because that, your justification and the baptism of the Spirit are the reason why we have all these blessings. Okay? So that's why he's this is what this those prepositional phrases are are referring to. So don't skip over them. You know, this is why the, the advantage of doing it the way we do it. We don't miss things. We don't like to miss anything. I just go over things with a fine tooth comb because that's when you really get all these golden nuggets out there. And uh, and so this is very uh, very exciting when you when you see this. And uh, so and then if, how everything falls together as amazingly as well as it does. So uh, you you just in honor of God's plan and what He did through His Son and the Spirit. So uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter two verse one. Look at uh, on my translation on the board. I had, to, I had to get a drink of water there because uh, I had I smoked a cigar last night. I probably shouldn't have. But uh, anyways, let's go. 
Ephesians 2, 1, my translation. Now, corresponding, but it was a good cigar. Now, correspondingly, even though each and every one of you is a corporate unit with spiritually dead ones because of your transgressions, in other words, because of your sins, each and every one of you formerly lived by means of these in agreement with the standard of the unregenerate people of this age, which is the production of the cosmic world system, in agreement with the standard of the sovereign ruler, namely the sovereign governmental authority, of course, that's Satan, ruling over the evil spirits, residing in the Earth's atmosphere, specifically the spirit who is presently working the lives of those members of the human race who were characterized by disobedience, the unbelievers. So notice he's talking about, in those verses, uh, the enslavement of the human race to Satan and his cosmic system in which we all were enslaved to prior to our justification. Then he says in verse 3, so the two of our great enemies are right there of the human race and of the church, Satan and his cosmic system. And now we have the third one, which is uh, the enemy within us, among whom, each and every one of us also, formally for our own selfish benefit, conducted our lives by means of those lusts which are produced by our flesh. The word flesh speaks of the old Adamic sin nature that resides in the genetic structure of everybody's physical body as a result of the imputation of Adam's sin at physical birth. That's why you die physically. Back to the dust of the ground you should go. That's why we're selfish and self-absorbed. This is why Jesus, Jesus' uh, human body had to be the product of the Holy Spirit impregnated in Mary, not Joseph. Because the 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 uh, the parents passed down the sin nature, so he says again, verse three. Among whom, each and every one of us also, formerly for our own selfish benefit, conducted our lives by means of those lusts which are produced by our flesh, specifically by indulging those inclinations which are produced by our flesh. In other words, those impulses which are the product of our flesh. Consequently, each and every one of us caused ourselves to be children who are objects of wrath because of our natural condition from physical birth, just as the rest correspondingly cause themselves to be children who are objects of wrath because of their natural condition from physical birth. So there it is. Sin, Satan, and his cosmic system. We were all enslaved to those things prior to our justification. Now, the grace of God, the love of God comes to, uh, to pass here in verse 4 to the end of uh, to verse 10. Then it says in verse 4, but, but because God is rich with regards to mercy, meaning he withholds judgment, because of the exercise of his great love, notice his mercy flows from his love, with which he loved each and every one of us, even though each and every one of us is a corporate unit with spiritually dead ones because of our transgressions, he, the Father, caused each and every one of us to be made alive together with the one and only Christ. Each and every one of you is a corporate unit to say because of grace. Now he's going to tell them how they became alive with Christ. Uh, verse 6 says it this, specifically, he caused each and every one of us as a corporate unit to be raised with him. That's our identification with Christ uh, in his resurrection through the baptism of the Spirit. Correspondingly, he says, he caused each and every one of us as a corporate unit to be seated in the heavenlies. And that's our identification with Christ in his session at the right hand of the Father. In other words, the Father looks at us as, us as raised and seated with Christ. We are positionally in the right at the right hand of God. Can you get any better seat in the house? No. <laughs> and here's the reason why. The prepositional phrase, in Christ Jesus in your Bibles, actually I translate it because of our faith in and union identification with Christ Jesus why? Because the figure of autonomy is put, being put there, meaning uh, the, Jesus Christ is put for faith in him at justification and our union identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit. It's causal, the preposition end there, which is translated in in your Bibles. It's actually causal. It's giving us the reason why God seated us with Christ and raised us with Christ. There it is. He did it because of our faith in Christ at justification and union identification with him. It's shorthand again. So verse 7 says, he did this so that he could display for his own glory during the ages to come, the millennial reign, the new heavens and the new earth, the incomparable wealth, which is the product of his grace, because of kindness, for the benefit of each and every one of us. Again, why? Because of our faith in and union identification with Christ Jesus. Each and every one of you, as a corporate unit, are saved because of grace, by means of faith. In other words, this salvation never originated from any one of you as a source. It originated as the gift from God. It, does, it never originated from meritorious actions as a source, so that a person cannot for their own benefit enter into the state of boasting. Then he says in verse 10, for each and every one of us are his creative workmanship. For each and every one of us has been created by means of our faith in and union and identification with Christ Jesus in order to produce actions which are divine good. These God prepared in advance so that each of us would conduct our lives by means of them. Then he says, therefore, in verse 11, which that therefore is saying that 
what he's about to say is an inference from the first 10 verses of the chapter. Therefore, each and every one of you is a corporate unit, must continue to make it your habit of remembering that formerly each of you who belong to the Gentile race with respect to the human body, specifically those who receive the designation uncircumcision, by those who receive the designation circumcision with respect to the human body performed by human hands. Each one of you used to be uh, characterized as without a relationship with Christ. Each of you used to be alienated from the nation of Israel's, Israel's citizenship. Specifically, each of you used to be strangers to the most important promise, which is the product of the covenants. Each of you used to not possess a confident expectation of blessing. Consequently, each one of you used to be without a relationship with God in the sphere of the cosmic world system. Then, like verse 4 uh, did in relation to verses 1 through 3, verse 13 now gives us the contrast uh, with the uh, verse 12, which, like verses 1 through 3, describes the pre-justification, pre-conversion state of the recipients of this letter, who were Gentile Christians in the Roman province of Asia. So he says in verse 13, However, because of your faith in and union identification with Christ Jesus, each and every one of you is a corporate unit who formerly were far away, have now been brought near by means of the blood belonging to the same Christ. For he himself personifies our peace, namely by causing both groups to be one, specifically by destroying the wall which served as the barrier, that is which caused hostility. And that's between the two races and the two races with God. In other words, now he explains it's the Mosaic law he's talking about, this hostility. In other words, by nullifying, by means of his human nature, the law composed of the commandments, consisting of a written code of laws, in order that he might cause the two to be created into one new humanity. What's the means by which he did this? Of course, it's by faith in himself and justification and union and identification with himself through the baptism of the Spirit at our justification. Thus, he says, he caused peace to be established between the two races and the two races with God. Then he says in verse 16, and by the way, when you talk about this hostility, the hostility was the result of the Mosaic Law. Remember, uh, the, the the Jews had no nothing to do with the Gentiles. They didn't eat with them because of the the clean the dietary regulations. The dietary regulations came about because God, when He brought them into the land of Canaan with Joshua, He did not want the Jews, His Jewish the Jewish people, the Israelites, to get involved in the worship of these foreign gods, these these gods that the Canaanites worshipped. And uh, one of the ways they would get involved with that is eating the meat, the food, types of food that they did and they're related to their worship of their false gods. So that's why the reason why they had the dietary regulations. So that's why Peter had to be convinced through a vision by uh, the, the Lord in Acts chapter 10 three times that it's all right to eat. He says, get up and eat. And Peter said, I can't, that's unclean, Lord. And the, the Lord said to him, as he said to them in Mark chapter 7, what the Lord considers, calls uh, uh, clean is clean. It's like, you know, if he says it's not, unclean, if it's not unclean anymore, then you can eat it. So he learned the lesson, and that meant he could go into Cornelius' home when Cornelius' uh, uh, people ca came calling for him. So that's why he entered in Cornelius' home. Otherwise, he wouldn't have entered into his home. Okay? okay? So, and the other thing is, is the Jews' misapplication of the law uh, by the majority of Jews caused a, a hostility between the Jewish and Gentile races because the Jews thought they were better than the Gentiles because they had the law. And of course, that's not why they got the law, that they were better than the, 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 uh, the Gentiles. It was by the grace of God that they got the law. All right, so it says in verse 16, it says in verse 16, in other words, in order that he would reconcile both groups into one body to God through the cross. Consequently, he put to death the hostility by means of faith in himself and justification and union and identification with himself through the baptism of the Spirit at justification. Correspondingly, he, as a result, came proclaiming peace for the benefit of each and every one of you, namely those who are far off. Likewise, peace to those who are near. Consequently, through the personal intermediate agency of himself, and each and every one of us as a corporate unit, namely both groups, are experiencing access by means of the omnipotence of the one Spirit to the presence of the Father. Indeed, e therefore, each and every one of you as a corporate unit are no longer foreigners, to the covenants of promise, that is, foreign citizens, but rather each and every one of you as a corporate unit, our fellow citizens with the saints, that is, members of God's household, because each and every one of you as a corporate unit has been built upon the foundation, which is the communication of the gospel to each one of you by the apostles as well as the prophets. Simultaneously, he himself, namely Christ Jesus, is the cornerstone, 
on the basis of its being continually fitted inextricably together by means of justification by faith and union identification with him, the whole building is growing into a holy temple by appropriating by faith union identification with the Lord. In other words, by appropriating by faith your union identification with him, all of you without exception are being built together into God's dwelling place by means of the omnipotence of the Spirit. So the declarative statement, our verse today in verse, seven, verse 17 is our, uh, our lesson. The declarative statement that it composes verse 17 corresponds actually to the previous assertions that were presented as we read in verses 11 through 16. Why? Because both passages, verse 17 and verses 11 through 16, both passages speak of Jewish and Gentile Christian communities experiencing peace with each other and with God through faith in Jesus Christ and through the baptism of the Spirit. However, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16 describes how Jesus Christ accomplished this peace between the, the two and these two with God. Whereas if you look at verse 17, that states that he came to these groups and preached this peace to both of them. Now the word for peace there, Irene, Irene it appears twice in Ephesians 2, 17. So the word for peace, Irene, it's the word, Greek word behind this word peace. Now the first time, it is modified by the articular expression tois makran. There it is in the Greek, and there's the transliteration. It's translated those who are far off. And then the second time, it's modified by the articular expression tois engus, which is translated those who were near. Now, as was the case in Ephesians 2, 14 and 15, this word for peace, erene, here in verse 17, means peace in the sense that it, because it pertains to harmonious relations and freedom from disputes in the absence of war between groups of people. In other words, this word pertains to the state of experiencing reconciliation. It not only speaks of the peace between Jewish and Gentile Christians, but it also pertains to the peace that exists between these two groups and God. So it's a double reconciliation here, as we've been seeing. Now, this is all indicated by the contents of verse 16, if you recall, which uh, uh, asserts, not inserts as a typo in my notes, asserts that Jesus Christ reconciled both groups into one new humanity to God through his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. So Jesus Christ personifies this peace that exists between Jewish and Gentile Christians in relation to God for four reasons. But let me, may I say to you, you know, and I've said this a million times throughout the years, the world, everybody in the world is looking for peace. You know, some people have no peace. They're unhappy and they're bit, they're, they're, they got guilt. There's things, that they just don't have peace. They're always on edge and uh, everybody in the world is looking for peace, okay? The world, the nations of the world are looking for peace. That's why they have the United Nations. You know, there's war all the time. The war, was, wars are proliferating. Even as we speak, you know, the United States has been all kinds of proxy wars since World War II. I mean, look at all the wars we've been involved in. Uh, you know, the Gulf, two Gulf Wars, you got Vietnam, you got the Korean War, we're in Afghanistan forever. I mean, on and on it goes, right? And then, and then you had the war on terror, there's a war for everything, right? And uh, so there's no peace. There's just no peace in this world. And, you know, there are a lot of people that uh, have been trying to get peace, and the world's looking for peace, and they're looking for a man who's going to, re that's right, I mean, we did a study on Antichrist, the world is looking for a one, one man that can bring it all together, and uh, so, but uh, he, he, the only one that's going to be able to bring it all together is the God-man, Jesus Christ, but the world is looking for peace apart from Jesus Christ, and, they're, and it's all vanity of vanity, right? It's not going to happen, and here's why. The reason why, as an individual, we have no peace as human beings is with sinners, we're enslaved to sin in Satan's cosmic system. We're miserable, okay? We don't realize how miserable we are until we get saved, right? Well, the only solution to that is to trust in the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. He give you peace to the soul because he can give you the forgiveness of sins. And so all the terrible things you've done in the past are, why, are paid at the cross. That's the, only one, that's the only reason why we could have peace as individuals is through faith in Jesus Christ. The other one, the, the nations of the earth, are going to continue to rage war. The Bible says that. I don't want that to happen, but that's the way it's going to have to happen. That's what the Bible says. Because this world likes to leave, live independently of Jesus Christ and find avenues to peace that are independent of him. Until someday, 
at his second advent. He's going to come and establish peace on the earth and he'll do it violently. Read Revelation 19 and 20, Zechariah 12 and 14, Matthew 24. He will do this. He will establish peace with a, with a rod of iron. And so he will do that and uh, all the rebels, the un, no, unregenerate, unrepentant people will be removed from the earth at that time when he comes back with the church to start the kingdom. And then there'll be peace and there'll be no more war because Satan, who's the God of this world and is manipulating the nations to do his bidding against God, he will be gone. So he won't be able to uh, get these wars going. That's why God wants you as a member of the Bride of Christ to pray for your leaders. Whether you like them or not is not even the point. God says pray for them. <laughs> and Because you want, you want peace, tranquil life. That's why Paul says to do that. So I pray for President Biden all the time, all the time. Whether I like whether I like him or not is not even the issue. It God says do it, okay. <laughs> and so you know we want the world's going to get peace, but it's going to get peace uh, only from Jesus Christ and he when he reigns. So there'll be no more war, the millennial reign of Christ, and Satan will be removed, and all everybody who's a rebel against him will be gone. So this world is contrary to Jesus Christ, and that's why it doesn't have peace. Okay? Because it's enslaved to the devil and his cosmic system. That's why the gospel can only is the only thing that's solution for us as individuals, us sinners, and the only solution to the world and the nations of the world. So, as I said to you before, Jesus Christ personifies this peace that exists between Jewish and Gentile Christians in relation to God for four reasons. Number one, we studied this when we did Ephesians 2.14, but it bears repeating. First, Jesus Christ is the author of peace, because it says in Ephesians 2.14, as, as you just read with me, that verse asserts that he caused both Jewish and Gentile Christians to be one group. Secondly, the second reason, his substitutionary, that means he died in our place, spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, which constitute him suffering the Father's wrath, are the basis for this peace that now exists between Jewish and Gentile Christians. So he's the author of peace and he's the basis for this peace. The Lord's suffering and we studied this doctrine, the doctrine of propitiation when I was in Massachusetts. The Lord's suffering propitiated, satisfied the Father in His holiness that's demanded that sin and sinners be judged. So the Lord suffered the consequences for our sins at the cross. So the Lord's suffering propitiated the Father and consequently it reconciled us sinners to a holy God. And we appropriate that reconciliation through faith in Jesus Christ. So in other words, people don't go to hell the lake of fire forever because of anything they've done. <laughs> That's right. You're going to the lake of fire for only one reason. It's because you rejected Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's the solution to your sin problem and mine. So, so that, why is that? Because every sin in human history, past, present, and future, was imputed or credited, we say, to Jesus Christ on the cross, and he had to suffer the consequences of our sins, which was the wrath of God. So that's why he was abandoned by his father, because that's what hell's going to be like, abandonment from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he suffered the physical torture, which tells us hell's going to be on the body as well, suffering for the body, a resurrection body to go through hell. You have, and then so you have, he suffered the, 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 the scourgings, two of them, and the crucifixion, the torture of the crucifixion, the worst uh, form of capital punishment devised to mankind, and also physical death. And that was all so we wouldn't have to suffer all this in the lake of fire. So the Lord's suffering propitiated the Father and thus reconciled us sinners to a holy God. And this interpretation is indicated by the contents of verses 13 and 16 of chapter 2. Remember, Ephesians 2.13 asserted that Gentile Christians have been brought near to God and His covenant people, Israel, by means of the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ is a representative analogy that speaks of Christ's suffering, the wrath of God, by suffering those spiritual and physical deaths on the cross. And so it's a representative analogy. The literal blood of Christ is an inanimate object. Yes, it's sinless because he didn't have a sin nature, but that's not, the, the, the blood, the literal blood itself is not the payment for us. It's the representative analogy. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The blood of, the, the, the blood of Christ's expression is, is reminding the Jews of the, of the blood of the Lamb, which was a picture of, of the death, Christ's death on the cross. So you think, what do you think God, you think God valued, what do you think was of more value to God? The suffering of his son's soul or his literal blood? You know, that's what mattered to God. So 
you know, the blood of Christ thing, it's a representative analogy, people. It speaks of Christ suffering the wrath of God on the cross. And we see that Ephesians 2.16 asserts that Jesus Christ reconciled both Jewish and Gentile Christians to God through his cross, which again speaks of him suffering the wrath of God by suffering a spiritual and physical death on the cross. When I say spiritual, so you might not be understanding what I'm saying there. Uh, I'm not saying when he suffered, when he suffered spiritually the spiritual death, he was abandoned by God the Father. That doesn't mean the Trinity was disrupted. No. It doesn't mean the hypostatic union was disrupted. No. It just simply means the fellowship between the Father and the Son was interrupted for the first time ever because of you and me. And he offered himself up through the eternal spirit. Hebrews 9.14. How did he do that? By applying and appropriating what the Spirit taught him in the Old Testament. Now, so you see he's he was abandoned by the Father and just can you imagine what a sacrifice? That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, let this cup pass, the cup, cup pass, the cup of wrath. What was he so what was he so upset about in the Garden of Gethsemane? Is that he would have to lose fellowship with his father for the first time. You and I can't identify with that. We lose fellowship with God. We sometimes we don't even think anything of it. Hopefully you confess your sins immediately. But imagine that. He had to do he was asked to do something that was good <laughs> for us. So that he valued, we can't even identify with that. What a great sacrifice it was for both him and the Father. And they had to do that. That was the only way to reconcile the human race to a holy God. You couldn't sweep our sins under the rug. Somebody had to make that payment. And this, by, by the, that's not child abuse, because Jesus went willingly. He willingly went. It says in Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7, that he did. I come in the role of the book that's been written to me, I've come to do your will. Over and over, he said, I come to do your will. And the will of the Father was, in this instance, you have to suffer my wrath so we can get right with, get these guys right. Okay? That's how much he loves you, people. Thirdly, Jesus Christ personifies the peace that now exists between Jewish and Gentile Christians in relation to God because he's the medium of this peace. And that's indicated by the contents of verse 18, which asserts that it is through him that both Jew and Gentile Christians have access to the Father by the Spirit. And then lastly, Ephesians 2.17 asserts that Jesus Christ is the proclaimer of this peace to those who are near to God and the Jews and those who are far away from him, the Gentiles. Now, interestingly, do you know that Jesus Christ was just sent to the house of Israel? It says that in, he, it says that in Matthew chapter, so how were the Gentiles? How did he preach to the Gentiles when he was only sent to the Jews? Didn't he say in, in Matthew chapter 15, Verses 24 through 27. So he answered his disciples, I was sent only to lost sheep of the Israel. Okay? That's who, only, only, exclusively. And that, and not the Gentiles. So how could Paul make this assertion? Well, here's how. This preaching of peace to both groups refers to the work of his apostles, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he himself preached to only the nation of Israel during his first advent. He was not sent to the Gentiles during his first advent. However, he did send and would send his apostles 50 days after his session at the right hand of the Father on the day of Pentecost in approximately June of 33 AD. On that day, as we pointed out earlier in the lesson and many times before, Peter began proclaiming the gospel of the Jews as recorded in Acts chapter 2, whereas Acts chapter 10 records him communicating the gospel to the Gentiles. Both received, as I said at the beginning of the, of the hour, both received the baptism of the Spirit which united them for the first time together. These two communities are united together. Thus, the racial prejudice between the two groups was gone. You know, I talked to, I have some brothers in Christ and um, African-American, they're good friends of mine. I love them dearly. But, you know, when they talk about, you know, they're, you know, they're my age and so they understand, they remember all the, the racial unrest and growing up and I remember seeing it too. Um, when I was a little boy, we lived in a town called Franklin for a little while it was like a farming, it was right near a dairy farm. And so we lived in, there was a, an African-American couple, black couple and their kids. And I was, my first friends were black. They were Timmy and Tom, the twins. And uh, Daryl, and their the last names were the Dillahunt. They were great people. We used to get the, their, their fathers come over and give us, uh, uh, from his garden, he had a great garden. So we were, we were friends, we grew up with, I didn't know anything about this, you know, unless I see it on the news, all this stuff going on. And uh, so we played, and uh, I remember that on the other side of that family, 
uh, was a family that uh, had a police officer and uh, and his wife and kid, and he was a he was a bigot. He was he really was he was a son of a gun. He used to get mad at me because <laughs> he used to get mad at me because I'd be playing with the black kids, <laughs> and so I didn't know why he was upset. And then you know I was like and I just thought he was just a jerk. And and uh, my dad would say it's because he's 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 a racist. <laughs> he doesn't like black people for whatever his reasons. Okay. He probably learned it from his father, and that's how it go keeps going. So, uh, you know, I so I saw all that. You know, so we were talking to my friends, you know, and we're saying about, you know, talking about, you know, all all the things that's gone on over the um, the last sixty years. You know, with the civil rights movement. I said, you know, to tell you the truth, I says, if, if, if you go and we could, you know, we had the Civil War and we had all this stuff. And and by the way, some people say, well, it was all about states' rights. I used to believe that too, and no, because the uh, the South actually went to the North, and uh, they said, "Well, uh, if you, uh, you know, if you don't uh, ban slavery, then we won't secede to the Union." That's not my opinion. That's on a documents that were sent. Okay, you can look that in the public domain. So yeah, it was the reason why they, because slavery was a big, big. The whole South was driven by slavery, just like the Roman Empire was in the first century. It drove their economy. So you're telling them to get rid of slaves, and then uh, so there goes their economy. Okay, so yes, it was, and that, that's not my opinion. That's I, somebody told to show me a historian told me that, and so I was like, wow, you know, because I was always thought it was all about states' rights. Yeah, states' rights was a part of it, but that really was not the reason why they seceded. It was because of the slavery issue. So he turns around, and I said, you know, just think about that. If the pastors in the north and the south. We're teaching Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. That war never could have would have taken place. And it neither would have been, and they taught the, their people about that, and there would never have been what we had in the 1960s and the 70s with all the unrest. We never would have had that. You know? Because, you, you know, think about the Roman Empire. In the first century, read the, read, the, read, the, read the epistles of Paul. Slaves. He addresses slaves and slave masters. Slave and slave masters were in the same churches together. And they... There was some estimate 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Okay, now there were the slavery was different than American slavery because we kidnapped people from Africa. Okay, this wasn't this was from the wars that Rome had, the Punic Wars, and so they would have professional all types of people were slaves, professional people, lawyers, doctors. They just incorporated them into their society, and so you think about that. They didn't have a war to end slavery. They used the gospel. Within three centuries, and a great historian named Will Durant, everybody forgets about him, he talks about this, and he's not even a believer. And the Christian gospel is what caused slave masters to give up their slaves, to give them their freedom, okay? And Paul addresses the, con and so Paul never says to people, the slaves and the slave, the slave masters, you get rid of your, you free your slaves. He never says that to them. But he does, you know, you look at the book of Philemon, he says he always appeals to their spiritual relationship. The slave, when he believes in Jesus Christ, is now on equal footing with his slave master. They're both in union with Christ. So therefore, the slave master said, hmm, treat others the way you want to be treated, right? I'm going to give this slave his freedom, my slave his freedom. We're now brothers and sisters in Christ. You see how the gospel just blows all that stuff away, all that racism and that bigotry? And I blame, let me tell you something, and I always, I always starts with the church and the leadership of the church. I blame the church for not teaching this stuff back then. And I, I'm sure there were guys who taught this. But how did this get, how did this movement get going? Because both had a big religious background. The early, the early part of this country, we had a big influence. Christianity did the Bible. How did it get to that point? You know, England got rid of slavery without a war. You know, the great Granville Sharp was a part of that. He was a Christian. But uh, so the gospel can solve the problems of race. It does, okay? We have evidence from that in the first century with Rome, when the slavery was gone from Rome without a shot being fired. So both Jews and Gentiles received the baptism of the Spirit and they were united for the first time, these two communities. The Lord Jesus Christ, he preached this peace to both groups through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit preached this peace through the apostles of Jesus Christ, whom he sent. In other words, Jesus Christ preached this peace to both the Jewish and Gentile communities through the Spirit working through the apostles. In other words, the apostles were simply the instrument 
that God, Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, used to preach the gospel of peace to these two communities. So Paul was sent to the Gentiles, and the other apostles were sent to the Jews. Not that the other guys didn't go to the Gentiles. We see that in Acts chapter 10. But primarily, Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles. He was sent out of Judea, not the other guys. The other guys, like Peter and John, they were out of Judea when the persecution came, and then they were dispersed. They were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. And that's John actually took over for Paul's ministry in the last, first, last, century, last decade of the first century. So Paul was sent to the Gentiles, and the other apostles were sent primarily to the Jews. Furthermore, think about this. Not only the apostles were employed by the Lord Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles by the power of the Holy Spirit, but also many evangelists and pastors and Christians simply operating in their royal ambassadorship have done this work throughout the centuries since the apostles. So you and I today are in the task of doing this we want to be our the Lord's instrument. Remember, we're members of his body. So you want to be used by the Lord, you got to know the gospel. And you got to get it right. And you got to live in a manner that's consistent with that. You want to represent Jesus Christ as an ambassador for him. And good behavior is very important. Follow, godly behavior is very important. Where you speak, where you act, have, as my father used to say, you have some class. So you get that class from applying the word of God and loving and treating your neighbor the way you'd want to be treated. Lo loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That gives you a class. Doing what the Bible says. Now, we need to wrap this study up. We see here in Ephesians 2.17, the referent of the personal pronoun su here, which is translated you in your Bibles. It actually, it's in the, it's in the plural. Look at your Bible. It says in Ephesians 2.17, look at the net Bible. It says, and he came and preached to you peace to you. So the word you, it's talking about, it, actually in the Greek, the word su, it's in the plural. Okay? That means more than one. In other words, all of you. So this tells you that God is a southerner. Y'all. That's what it literally means. Y'all. <laughs> and because Paul's concerned about each and every person, this word's used in a distributive sense, meaning each and every one of you is a corporate unit. That's why I translate it the way I do. So, this word you, personal pronoun sue. It's referring to the recipients of this epistle who Paul describes here in Ephesians 2.11 as Gentile Christians. The word not only refers to these Gentile Christians living in the various com Christian communities throughout the Roman province of Asia as a corporate unit, but it's also, as I said before, used in a distributive sense, emphasizing no exceptions. That's the translation, each and every one of you. Now, as was the case in Ephesians 2.13, the adverb of separation, makron, here in Ephesians 2.17, which is is translated far away. It's used in a figurative sense of a relationship that did not exist between these Gentile Christians and God and his covenant people, Israel. And as was the case in Ephesians 2.13, the adverb angus, here in Ephesians 2.17, which is translated near in your Bibles, is also used in a figurative sense of the close, intimate relationship that existed between God and his covenant people, Israel. And the repetition of this word peace, irene, here in Ephesians 2.17, emphasizes that both Jewish and Gentile Christian communities were experiencing not only peace with each other, but both were experiencing peace with God. You know, it's a beautiful thing to be able to lay your head down on the pillow at night and have peace with God. You know, you don't have to fear death as a Christian. You got peace with God. You know, I remember when my, my brother Kenny passed away back in November 2023, cancer. It was terrible. He was 55. You know, three kids, one's, uh, one's in uh, high school, junior now, and the other one's a senior in college, and the other one's a, a school teacher, uh, and uh, one girl and the uh, two boys. And it was terrible, and it was br brutal. He had uh, this cancer that he, probably as a result of the job he worked, he worked in hazardous ways, and it was awful. And so, you know, he was, uh, I remember, you know, to, you know, he heard me giving the gospel many times. He came to visit me in Iowa a couple of times and actually lived with me couple of times when he, he, he stayed with me but he heard the gospel many times and I remember you know as I knew he was going to have to get this surgery done to remove it and move a piece of his move his jaw I remember uh just giving him the gospel again making sure that him and his wife and that that he understood you know that you have you don't have to fear death you have peace with God you know you trust in Jesus as your savior I don't know how this is going to turn out he might decide to take you he might spare your life I don't know but all I do know is you need to know this 
Ken, and this is it. And that's what I told him. And I, when he was in the hospital and the surgery didn't work and it went south, I was reminding him that when I came out to visit him like three times and then he passed away. But in fact, he lost consciousness. The last time he lost consciousness, we were, I was praying for him. And uh, he just, he never, he never came uh, through to again. So you know, that's, that's, but you know what? What gives me, uh, helps me get through it is uh, losing him as uh is his is my faith and his faith, knowing that he, it simple faith in Jesus Christ gives you peace with God. So, you know, I was telling you, know, next, you know, if we, you'll be absent from the body, face to face with the Lord, it'll be like, and don't worry about the kids and, and Debbie and all everything. I, the Lord will take care of them, just like He took care of you. I watch. You. We'll we'll keep an eye on the, everybody, and uh, you know, don't you, you know, you'll be okay. And uh, in fact, I want to go where you're going. And I, I pleaded with God to let me go, because I'm old. I was the oldest one. I was like, I figured I was going to go first. And, uh, and so he, he got, he, he beat me to it. So, but, uh, you know, peace, you know, people who in the head, they're, they're afraid. I used to be, when I was a little boy, I used to be scared to death of, of death. When I was a little boy. I mean, Vietnam was always on television, the, the assassinations, you know, Bobby Kennedy dying. And it was like, it was like, I was on television. It was like, you know, it, it bothered me. I was like, I don't know if little kids ever were affected by that, but I was my, my, one of my babysitters. He was, uh, he died in Vietnam. He, on the day he was supposed to go home on Christmas Eve, they had some shelling and they killed him in his sleep. I remember that guy. Still see him in my head. He used to babysit me. Great guy. And uh, he was gone. So death was terrifying. And then when I got saved, you know, all that fear went away, you know? In fact, it was, it was replaced with joy. I got peace, you know? So that's the message we need to send to people. And the world, the world is, people are miserable because they don't have peace. Now this verb er erkamai, the verb erkamai in this passage where it says, you know, it says in Ephesians 2, 17, it says he came, the word came, there's erkamai in the Greek. And this word speaks of Jesus Christ coming to both the Jewish and Gentile Christian communities in the sense of traveling to and arriving at the geographical locations of both of them through his spirit-led and empowered apostles. And this word's actually functioning as a, a, a participle conjugation. It's in the nominative, simple, it's a nominative of simple opposition with regards to its grammar, that simply means, people, that it's identifying an activity of Jesus Christ which corresponds with him reconciling both Jewish and Gentile Christian communities to each other and with God through his finished work on the cross. And this word's also functioning as what we call a result participle, which indicates that the, uh, the former identifies the result of Jesus Christ reconciling both Jewish and Gentile Christian communities to each other and both groups with God through his finished work on the cross, namely... He preached peace to both the Jewish and Gentile Christian communities through the Spirit, His Spirit-empowered proclamation of the gospel by His apostles. And the word uh, evangeli uh, inv evangelizo, <laughs> evangelizo is the word for preach, okay, evangelizo. And it speaks of Jesus Christ proclaiming peace to both Jewish and Gentile Christian communities through His apostles, uh, Spirit-empowered apostles' proclamation of the gospel to both groups. And of course... This piece refers to the reconciliation that now exists between Jewish and Gentile Christian communities and the reconciliation that these two groups now enjoy with the Holy God as a result of the Father declaring them justified through his one faith in His one only Son, Jesus Christ. And consequently, they were identified with Jesus Christ in His crucifixion, His death, His burial, His resurrection and session at the right hand of the Father through the baptism of the Spirit which took place at justification. So this justifying faith and union identification with Jesus Christ actually united these two communities with each other and these two groups with God. So it was all the work of God. And lastly, Paul's actually alluding to Isaiah 52, 7 and 57, 19 here in Ephesians 2, 17 in order to emphasize the peace God the Father established between the Jewish and Gentile Christian communities and these two communities with himself. And as we noted in Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16, these verses teach that the Father accomplished this twofold reconciliation, reconciliation between the Jewish and Gentile Christian communities and these two groups' reconciliation with God. Verses 14 through 16 teach us that the Father accomplished this twofold reconciliation through the finished work of His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. The Father also accomplished this twofold reconciliation through the work of the Spirit at justification, when at which time the Spirit placed these two groups and union with his son, and again, identified them with his son and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. And it's the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel 
that can give peace to the various communities and various races and groups and give peace to the nations. It's really, it's all the only hope for America and the countries, the nations of the world and only hope for humanity. It's the gospel because the problems of humanity are supernatural in, 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 in nature. We're enslaved to sin and Satan is cosmic system. The world's a mess because we're a bunch of wacko sinners and there's a devil who hates us and there's uh, his angels and they wage war against us and they want to oppose God and they want to take this earth. It's theirs, they think, and they're going to fight for it. And so you and I, the only solution is the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, accession of Jesus Christ on the cross because that those events in Jesus' life destroyed the works of the devil and have dispossessed Satan and the fallen angels for his rulers of this earth. And so when we believe in Jesus and we're identified with him, and those events in his life, we become we're con we now have automatically have the victory over these enemies of ours, which are the enemies of the whole human race. And now we're to share that message with the world, everybody we come in contact with. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Let's uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray this lesson be a blessing to your people, bringing glory to you and your